everybody. Welcome to the Faith and Fandom podcast. Uh, today, really excited to have my friend Jackie Kraft with us today. So uh, for the people that might not know you well, uh, give us like the new season of TV, The Road So Far intro of who Jackie is. I'm always so bad at this, but I, uh, I'm Jackie. Uh, or Ruth, if you know me locally, um, you can call me either name. Jackie Jackie Craft is my brand and my persona, and I love I love everything that I've created around her. I sell patterns, cosplay patterns online. I've traveled the country for the last six years, meeting a lot of people that are really enthusiastic about cosplay and teaching workshops and panels, and then eventually doing a lot more of the uh, behind the scenes work, uh, contract negotiation, agent kind of stuff for other people. As I began to pull out of the spotlight myself, because I just don't really enjoy it. <laughs> at all. So I, um, in all of this pandemic, I just decided I was going to just make a hard turn in my career and take it as a sign and kind of sort of change from that chapter. So it still embrace my, my cosplay and maker community that I love so much, but kind of pull what I love about it into the next chapter. So I, uh, I'm doing a lot of new different things that aren't cosplay related. I'm co-leading my church's college ministry and I'm applying for a really big local job in a, a theater here. So I don't know. I'm, I'm going a different direction, but I'll always be tapped into cosplay. I'm even making a costume for my little cousin right now. So the costume thing is in my heart, you know, but life is, is changing for a lot of us, I think, because it'll really never be the same. No, it won't be. And one of the things that I think people really, they get hung up on or when change is happening is that they think I work so hard to get to be this and if I stop being this, I'm failing. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, for you, you've been a lot of different things. And um, yeah, and, and I don't really see it as failing. I see, I, I love, uh, you know, I think a lot of us were brought up with that mentality of, um, you know, find a good job. It's, I don't know if a lot of us were, but in my area, it's very much like told to young people, get a good job, either government or county or, or town, you know, get something with retirement and benefits. But the thing is, um, I think our generation has almost embraced this chapter episodic kind of lifestyle because we find it more rewarding and fulfilling. And I attribute a lot of my, my happiness, well, all my happiness to God. But secondly, God's choices for me clearly have been this chapter life. And it has made me, it's given me a lot of freedom and it's brought me so much joy. So I can't imagine sitting at a desk for 25 years and then retiring. I, I like evolving and seeing what, what's next for me whether it's a success or a failure, you know? What's uh, with, uh, for me, like, I think probably about six years ago, my entertainment desires really shifted from being a movie person to being a TV person. Like, I think the quality of storytelling with uh, digital streaming and everything else has dramatically shifted how we present things anyway. But I would glad, I would more likely watch a 10 hour TV series with a full development than a two hour movie where everything's crammed and rushed. And we used to grow up and well, we still do because kids still get asked this every day or whatever. What do you want to be when you grow up? And yeah. like, we like, you have to pick one thing instead of like, tell me the journey you want when you're older. It's like, yeah, it, it's, it's, I think it's a big mind shift of, uh, it's a big mind shift. Cause I can, I can say that like none of the stuff that I had planned for my life went the way I had planned. And um, yeah. me either of, dramatically. <laughs> and that's the thing, like I, uh, I wanted to teach uh, third grade. You'd be good at that though. <laughs> I, would, I would have a ball with that. I yeah. wanted to teach third grade and I wanted to do a uh, pro professional theater. That was like, that was, that was my, that was my life. Cause like my third grade teacher was for my childhood, like the most impactful person in my life. And um, then I got into high school and dove headfirst into the theater community. And um, mm. that's really what I wanted to do. And, you know, I wanted to be able to guide people and I wanted to be able to convey with uh, presentation and theatrics and all that stuff. And it's just like, none of that actually happened, but all of that actually happened. <laughs> yeah, it kind of capacities. did in its own way. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's been good. Like I, I work with kids ministries and I work with, you know, I, there's a point where somebody said that you should work with college ministry. And I literally sat at my kitchen table with the guy who ran a campus crusade for Christ for Raleigh at that point in time. And, um, I looked at him and said, dude, I will never work with college ministry. And, um, wow. and then the next year I started an 11 year 
collegiate ministry. Journey. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, it's whatever. A super successful college ministry. It, it was, it was, it was um, all glory to God with that. Cause I look back at it. I, I literally had a, one of the guys who grew up in my college ministry is now a campus minister where I was. That's and, amazing. um, and he, so he sent me this text maybe two weeks ago. He's like, how did you get such a diverse group and make us all feel welcomed? And I'm always like, bro, I had no idea what I was doing. It was Jesus and hustle. And that's about yeah. all I had. <laughs> and that's the thing is they kind of like it when you are humble and unsure of what to do with them, but you're, you're showing up and your enthusiasm there and you really want to support whatever you want to be the support structure for them. But you, even if you don't know how it's, they don't seem to mind. <laughs> They really don't. They're just happy that people are invested in them and interested in providing some kind of safe, you know, interesting social structure for them. Well, that's with that too. Like uh, one of the things I think people get so easily or not easily frustrated, but that have a potential for frustration is that if it doesn't happen automatically, like mm. doesn't blow up real quickly, then it must not be successful. And that's, I was telling the guy who was, who had asked me that, that, uh, it took, I had two years of never having more than 11 students. Oh, wow. And, I think uh, 11 is a great number. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like my first year, I think I had four. And then my second year it got to 11. And then like year three, there were 75. And then, and like, then 120, it, didn't you balloon up to like 120 or something? Yeah, it was, it was one of those things of like, okay, I have no idea how any of this worked, but cool. Um, but it's, it's the neat situation of if you're just faithful with what you're doing that, you know, life god and everything we're doing really actually opens these doors and uh so for you i think you know i've been a fan of you since i've met you like um not just like well, we instantly got along I, I i don't know why but you know again god puts people in each other's lives but, you know well that's like uh i mean just literally the first time you walked past my booth with uh your piranha plant when you were Ivy, like Gosh, that was so long ago. That was that was a lifetime ago. <laughs> um, I I I think I have I've grown a whole small human since. That yes, point. you have, and the other ones have grown up a lot. So. Yes, um, but like from that point, like you were, I just remember connecting with you, like just thinking you were like kind and humble then, and then just watching your journey kind of unfold. I've just been a fan of watching, not just you and your development, but watching how God's moved your life around. And Aww. the things he's done with you, because like you've been a story I've told you, you've literally been anybody that like knows my local bubble and ministry bubble, like has heard your name. Um, so nice, like, Hector. It's uh, to the point that um, you, you watched one of our church's sermons on YouTube. Loved it. Yeah. yeah. Um, our production guy um, who was in, who works in our collegiate ministry, he literally like came up to me after the service. Is this Jackie Jackie? Like, cause he, he saw oh. your, YouTube, we, oh, yeah, yeah, we commented, I was like, what's got, up? And somebody was like, is that her? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so. That's awesome. But, well, hello production. Yes. <laughs> what's his uh, name? Mike Panino. What's up, Mike? <laughs> but uh, one of the things is just like watching your journey. I've just been so, just kind of in awe of just how things were. Just like from one of the things like with the whole wizard thing out the gate. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just like, so tell me, like, what do you think the big, like, milestone pieces of your journey have been with, like, just, just on the, with you, life in general, or just yeah. with the, the whole nerd world journey? Well, so here's the thing. So I'll give you a little, a little um, spiel about me. So I, like you, my journey was going to be different. I, I was a nerd in school. I love academics still to this day. I study all the time. My, if you go to my YouTube algorithm, the second option for topics is history. I love learning. I can't help it. And I, um, I actually was going to go to, I went to Chapel Hill and I was going to graduate with a, um, a pharmacy. I wanted to go into drug discovery and pharmaceuticals. Like, cause it was just, it was nerdy and interesting and I love chemistry and science and, 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 and creating things, like creating new drugs and stuff. But then, um, in hindsight, I'm, uh, I'm really glad that I didn't do that. Like looking back, it's, I was so gung ho about it or I wasn't really gung ho. It just felt like the natural thing to do with my brain. I was like, I have a brain that seems okay. What should I do with it to benefit the world? And that made sense then. Now it makes no sense. I, that is not where I would think our brains, you know, are really, really bright should go because I don't support the pharmaceutical industry. But um, 
I, most, most of us don't, even though a lot of us may participate and need things from the pharmaceutical industry, it's just not that great of a place to, to, to work in. They, they work really hard weeks and um, in general, it didn't appeal to me. So I came back home and ran my family's in for a while while I um, kind of figured out what I wanted to do. I had a health issue for a while there, which some of you that follow me on social media know I've, I'm dealing with a little bit again, but it's a uh, positive so far, but I started messing around with the uh, costuming and creativity. I never really knew I had anything like that in me, but my Nana's an artist. My mother's an artist. It's hers. And I, um, I saw cosplay pop up and I thought, all right, I'm going to try this. And it was really enjoyable because of the community. I came, I was gaming really hard in college, terribly hard, like too much. I mean, actual gaming addiction kind of stuff. And I was very successful in my gaming career. Um, and it's so obnoxious to even talk about that out loud. I know I just told my college ministry, I was like, look, y'all, I'm going to tell you about myself because I want you to know who I am, the good and the bad. Um, but the problem is it's so so obnoxious and weird to talk about gaming because gamers that at, that play at a really high level don't enjoy talking about it because the truth is what have you accomplished at the end of the day i wasted a lot of time getting world first ranks on things that uh what do i do with it now you know it's like in all I, and i ignored a lot of family a lot of friends relationships went out the window and so now that i'm encountering a lot of college i feel specifically suited to deal with high school and college um, ministry because uh they really are struggling with gaming. Gaming is a core part of their, of their youth culture. That's the truth. It is in many really? ways. And I found ways to pull myself out of that addiction and re kickstart my life again and um, essentially find, a healthy, find healthy habits for gaming. And now that I've done that, I want to show people the benefits of having a real tapped into the outside world life where you're talking to your local community, getting to know your neighbors, having real social interactions. And then also you can still have your online gaming community. You have to have balance. I think that we as a species almost demand it from ourselves. Otherwise we become these like dark cave curmudgeon creatures. And I was guilty of that as well in gaming. I mean, I gamed in a, in a male dominated um, top tier competitive arena and I suffered for it. I mean, I really had a hard time um, you can't lead male gamers very easily. And I did, I was a strategy officer in, in a US six guild for a while. And uh, they don't like, it was hard. It was hard and you, you, you know, I made a lot of mistakes along my journey, but what I learned was the gaming culture changes us. It does change us. Sitting in a game 24 seven, feeling, feeling that FOMO and feeling the need to get back in and check, on, check in on everybody, that creates something different in our personalities that we don't even realize until we step back and look at it and see like we were short with people that walked up to us and want to talk to us while we were gaming. Or, you know, if we were in the middle of a raid, it's like, dude, get out of the room. What do you mean? I'm, oh, and I die, you know, wipe the raid, something. You can't. Leroy Jenkins. You're just not a normal person. You're not the, the normal stereotypical person, but that's okay. It's okay to have that chapter, admit that you had that chapter and deep process it. The thing that we've not normalized in our society is uh, it's so funny. We've normalized like talking about depression and, and um, sexual orientation and tons of other things. Well, we haven't normalized talking about our gaming addiction that the CDC has now listed as an addictive thing. And it's running rampant like wildfire in our community. Anybody that watches Twitch or watches Asmongold on Twitch, for example, sees there is a 45,000 person thick community just watching that one person. And you can learn a lot from them by reading the chat and just, it's different. And uh, I feel like the real world has really disconnected from the online world. It, it's truly divorced. And we're sorry, I just tangent so hard, Hector. I just realized how hard I I'm so passionate about the gaming thing I've been talking about a lot lately. So that's my chapter, anyways. I had a hard, hard gaming chapter and I pulled out of it. But so um, like my, my my gaming chapter never hit that. Um, but you know, just uh on a my flex level, I was the blockbuster video game champion for North Carolina of 1993. Dude, that is epic. <laughs> blockbuster dude that's something that you got to tell people because blockbuster is like an ancient relic of our culture you know there's they, one they, left i think yes there to my knowledge there's one the, you, but you had to uh go to your local blockbuster and play uh ninja turtles tournament fighter um nba jam and uh, nba jam dude that's awesome and clay fighter tournament edition and like uh if you won for your state you got a free video game, a medal, and rentals for a year. Dude, you got a medal. I got a medal. I have no idea where it is. I never got any medals. It was the 90s. But uh, also, too, like, uh, one of the, like, I, you know, he, in hearing you speak with that, I've not 
done the online gaming level or to that point where that's been a big thing for me, but I know that a lot of people do struggle with it. And um, during the Love Thy Nerd online con we did like a couple weeks ago, uh, really came into contact with Satellite Gaming. And there's a dude uh-huh. there named Jamie. And mm-hmm. his heart and ministry for that community is something to the level I've never seen. Wow, um, that's amazing. Um, and so, like, uh, I think it, he's a really solid, like, his whole organization's a really solid light in that. Uh, I'd like to look, I'm going to look into him because I, I think that giving ministry to the gaming community is going to be, like, that is the, not the crusades, that's insane. Or I don't mean the crusades because that's, like, a very violent <laughs> analogy. Um, It's, uh, it's going to be brutal. He's, yeah you know, he's going to push, he's going to be pushed back constantly because they're not ready to be ministered to. They're very turned off by the world and everything. They're bitter. They're resentful. They don't, they don't know how to connect to humanity in the normal, you know, outside world. They don't really want to because they don't see a lot of value in it. So it's going to be a, a tough journey. Like God is setting him on a mission that, um, he'll, he'll do well with because God always prevails. But if you, you know, he, he will, but, um, I hope he has thick skin. I'm there for him though, if he needs me, (laughs) because it's going to be rough. But I think that that's the group that we, if, if anyone has a connection to that and is a Christian, we got to, you know, they need attention. They need love. They need, they need something to believe in outside of, uh, you know, what they're getting from the online gaming world. So. So from your gaming chapter, what, where, where are you next? Um, so obviously I did a lot of cosplay. I loved, um, working with Blizzard was a lot of fun. I, they've hired me for, f- this will be my fifth year. Um, a lot of different things. I've really enjoyed them. I did recently turn down a documentary. Um, they offered to send two people out to film my story. And, uh, I, I had already decided earlier this year that I just didn't want to be in the spotlight anymore. I'm doing this because this, I don't, I like podcasting. I like talking. It doesn't feel like that polished, um, presented, you lose control of editing kind of spotlight. I don't like that. I don't want to be on reality TV. I auditioned for uh, three shows last year. Uh, well, te- well, I guess one was technically for me to build the props for a Food Network show. So it wasn't uh, me being on it. But um, two other ones were me being on a reality show. And I had a terrible, terrible audition where I cried in the airport and asked God for a sign. And he gave me one. I mean, he gave me a foolproof sign, like a shocking sign. Like if it's, it's hard for me to, to talk to non- non-believers about it because obviously they're like, what do you mean? It's you hearing yourself. But I think you know the difference. You know when you have not curated the world around you, when the world is acting in such, an, such a remarkable way, that, and to show you a sign, that's divine intervention. And <clears throat> I was on my way back from a really terrible TV audition where I couldn't have my phone. And they asked me, it was just, it made me feel, <sighs> how to start? I can't tell, I can't talk too much about it because it's NDA, but I'm gonna tell you the story around it because it needs to be told. It's a, it's not a good industry. I don't, I don't really wish anyone would aspire to be in like a reality TV star or a celebrity at all. Honestly, I think it's a a lonely life. It's full of narcissism. It's full of a lot of people that are going to take advantage of you. A lot of people that do not care if you succeed and they're hoping that they can use you as a stepping stone. Like it's, it's not a good, uh, a good culture really. And I auditioned for that show and they really wanted me to do some things that I wasn't comfortable with. And, I, and my thoughts as I was sitting in the airport on my way back home was, uh, how did I get this job? Why did this reach out to me? Why did they reach out to me? Why did they think that I would be qualified for this? Why the heck did they pick this quirky, weird little North Carolinian girl who's super, commu- you know, loves her big community and family and wanted me to do this like kind of manipulative thing. Um, and I, uh, I cried in the airport and I was stuck in Philadelphia and they canceled my flight. It had been, I am, I, if you follow me on Instagram, y'all be knowing that I fly too much and I'm sleeping in airports and I'm always getting canceled. (laughs) It's terrible. And there I was on my way back and I, um, I sat in the airport and they canceled everything and they're like, all right, here's your passes. They gave us all like hotel vouchers, which was rare, like rare. You usually sleep in the airport, but I didn't, uh, I didn't want to leave because it was late. And there's a, if you guys fly, you know that, um, I don't know if you know this, but if you land in an area, certain areas past 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock, you, the airline gets, gets fined. They get a, a noise penalty for landing. So when it's late, I know flights aren't going out. And I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm getting back to Norfolk. So uh, they gave us that. It all cleared out. There was like four of us or something in the area. And we were in a weird little back alley. And um, I hope I can tell us about crying. I'm such a crier, you guys. I hope somebody else is a crier out there and understands. But I'm embarrassingly a cry. I was just talking to my, co- my uh, cousin about it. I'm like, I cry in church. I cry giving a speech. I cry all the time. I can't help it. 
Um, but I sat there in my, my airline or the, those really uncomfortable seats. And I, pr I put my hand in my head and I was, I was crying. And I, I said, God, how did I get this job? What have I done? You know, what path have I gone down that has disappointed you so much that I'm clearly not getting jobs that are God oriented. And, um, I said, if you could just get me home tonight, I'll stop this. I won't go down this path anymore. I promise. I swear to you, I will, uh, I will use the skills that you've given me for you. And, um, and uh, two, I was balling y'all balling as you can imagine from just this and two airline attendants walked up at 11 10 and got on the thing and said, the pilot's here and he's insisting we go back to Norfolk. So if there's any of you left for going. And, uh, well, what do you do with that? Like after, after years of flights being canceled, sleeping in the airport on, or right before Christmas in St. Uh, Salt Lake City, I can't even remember. I knew that that was God because there's, there's just no way. And uh, I came home and uh, well, that was August last year. I did my fine, I did BlizzCon uh, because it was such a good job with, uh, I had a big, you know, a group of my Barb group. I got my bag here. These are my Barb, shout out my, my Cause of the Ancients group. They made me feel so good about humanity. I put a call out and said, hey, any strangers want to be a part of this group where I bought these designs, had them designed out of stuff that I'd sent to Zach Fisher. And um, I said, let's just, let's just make new friends. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And uh, I partnered with Plaid and had goodie bags sent to every single member from Australia to England. Um, I, it was special. It was so special and I will feel, feel so connected to them. And I, and I didn't tell anyone, but that was kind of like my big bang, you know, like my finale, my community finale. And, um, I, uh, I came home and I started spending a lot more time with my family and I realized this is, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do next. I was like, God, I'm, I'm lost y'all. Like I hear you, but I'm lost. And, uh, Verizon reached out and offered me to a whole year contract with collaborative effort um, and SAG credits. So I got my first like Screen Actors Guild credits this year. And I was like, maybe this is, I don't know if this is God, you know, I'm not that, I'm not an, un, I, I'm a bright gal. I'm not one of those Christians that's like, this is God and this is God. Oh, God had me blowing my nose better today. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not ridiculous, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but I, I got the Verizon job and they were wonderful. And when I went to ask for pay, I did it based on my previous jobs and they paid me more. And I was like, what? In a time when the world was shutting down, my industry was over. My dog ha has had two bladder resections this year. All the money went to him really. And um, I, uh, I was so happy that this happened and it was, they were wonderful. I flew to New York and filmed my commercial in February and then did a con in Richmond because the Virginia cosplay crew and the North Carolina cosplay crew have always been so wonderful to me. It feels like home. They, uh, they just, they talk to me so comfortably. We have a good time. It feels like, uh, it just doesn't feel like work. It really does like feel like hanging out with, with buddies. So I did, I did a con there and then um, that was the end. And uh, I never really enjoyed promoting myself online or building my social media. Never cared. Uh, I don't care about posts on schedule or hashtags. And let me tell y'all, hundreds of friends have reached out to me over the years. Like, let me help you. Let me help you build. I don't want to. I don't, I have no desire to expand. I want my, my following to be as organic as possible. Like I want it to be people who truly have maybe met me even limited to that even. And, uh, because there's nothing quite like an in-person interaction. You'll never get to know me another way than that. You know, that's the, that's the best way online. We really just know a little bit about each other. You, you have to try to make those human connections. And, um, so, so Verizon, I guess that was a big highlight and they've been wonderful. And I even reached out this week and passed on 10 names to them for other people to work with, uh, as I do with every job, because raise all boats, y'all. There is no gatekeeping. If you're gatekeeping, I got 75 sledgehammers. I'll come out like Medusa swinging. I don't believe in that. I believe that if you do that, you are, cru you are crushing your own career, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. <sighs> so I try very hard to uh, pass things on when, I've, when I'm close, close to chapter. And I hopefully, you know, I may still work with Verizon um, because they're, it, it was wonderful. Um, but I also believe that if any of these wonderful personalities can help them and because they've treated me so well, I say here, you know, make content with these people that are still doing, you know, something in a different career than what I am now. But I, I don't, um, just to be clear, I don't knock the people that are, are, uh, you know, making tutorials and that's putting them in the spotlight. I think you're doing something cool. I think you're, you're teaching people a skill and that is so valuable. Everyone should have skills in hobbies because otherwise life's a little bit boring. I mean, Jesus was a carpenter amazing so that's a great skill to have 
Um, I have a lot of furniture that needs fixing if, you, if, you, if you're around, bud. But uh, <laughs> so I, um, I guess like, you know, Blizzard Nintendo was a big, big hit for me. Wizard World, Brittany Wallach, who now is the manager of Critical Role. If you guys know Critical Role, Matt Mercer. Shut up, yeah. Um, so Brittany Wallach is the very first person to hire me in 2015 on the spot. She started my whole career. And I still to this day thank her. She's like, she's like, you don't need to keep thanking me. I thank her emotionally multiple times a year. I thank her every year at BlizzCon when I see her backstage. I let her know that she did this because, I mean, well, obviously I give God credit, but I'm saying in this human world, that, that person saw me in my Lich King and said, hey, you have a fun personality and I like this after talking for a while. Um, do you, would you like to come be a cosplay guest? She hired me right then in that moment and put me on stage that night. She didn't hesitate. Uh, which was bananas and, to me. That's that's been one of the parts of your story I've told like so many people that have been like, I'm like, look, make good things and be yourself and go. Be yourself. Yeah. Because you, I mean, like, I think I have a me and Vincent have a photo with you and your uh, your sword. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> but like, like we met you in the lobby of Wizard, like mm -hmm. right when that happened, or right. Yep. Before, like and I can it was still just, remember the hallway. <laughs> And it was just like, literally that you had just been hired by Wizard was like the thing where you're like, what? Wait, and <laughs> you then you came up right after. That's such an interesting point. I forgot about that in our story. Wow, weird. Hmm, very interesting. And now here Brittany is, She's she helped me and helped me multiple times. I, I sent her um, contract stuff even last year to review, or earlier this year to review. She's a wonderful person. She really is. And look at her succeeding. You know, she's uh, Critical Role's got its own Amazon series. Yeah. And so good people, I, I mean, karma, whatever you believe in, there is something coming back for being good. You should try to be good. Kindness goes a long way. It really does. And taking a chance on people. That's why I've all, when I hired for a lot of my jobs, Blizzard gave me the opportunity to have budget to hire people, which was nice. I got to hire um, uh, Brittany Genoza, who I love, and my friends Liz and uh, Jen, Jingle Boo Boo. I got to hire cool people for jobs and that was probably one of my favorite things. And then Maker Fair is probably my, my favorite convention of all. And I got to serve on the advisory board for Maker Fair and that tied with a lot of the people I met just in the maker community really pushed me towards that's the, that is, that is what I like the most about my community. I like engineering. I've got so many electronics in this room. It's insane. I love engineering. My pop's an engineer. I like electronics, even the most basic, simple things. I love seeing all the women in our community. The men are great. Shout out men. I know y'all, y'all need some love in this community too, but I saw like, um, a lot of my friends that would build their own 3d printers and, um, and create smoke machines, their own line of smoke machines and things. Wayne also has some, just so shout out to the fellas. But, um, I, I saw ingenuity in a different way outside of just the artistic side. I saw, um, math and science that could be applied and the two worlds really collided and when they collided the coolest stuff occurred you know that all of us are super impressed when we see the science and the art come together it, that truly is what's happening and i realized meeting kids at that event that the world had changed dramatically it was at maker fair i was like oh my gosh these young people what nine years old showing me their ipad full of all their digital art they'd created um i bought a um a cloud re speech recognition arduino module from an 18 year old who made it when he was 16. he's like i like the whole alexa concept so i want to make my own I, and i was like i need it right now like of course you did that's amazing i met what our future looks like in person there was a hundred thousand people at our last maker fair event and it was mostly families. And I, I was just shocked. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going back home and we don't have anything like this nearby. This is a rural area and it's, it's country in a beautiful way. It's, it's Southern and sweet in all the ways that you guys think of the South. It really is uh, its own special place here. And uh, I was like, man, how do I bring this here? So early this year, along my journey of, of trying to figure out what to do next, I realized I absolutely have to have a maker fair here. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm just going to find a way to raise the money because I don't care. Money will come. That, people are laughing at that right now. They're going to be like, oh, money. Isn't that great to say? It would come. The thing is, though, you learn how to write grants. That's what I've got to say about money. If you want money for a project, learn how to write grants. You just need an eighth grade education. They need to be written that simple. That's what they like. Um, it, it, there's a whole class you could take online for it if you want. But if you have a dream, 
you can get, you can bring it to life. Absolutely. You can, there's nothing stopping you. And I live in that mindset. And a lot of people may think, Oh gosh, that's so, you know, a little hair brainy, like, Oh, you know, dreams, you know, dreams don't come through, come true for everybody. That's there's hard work and all these things that go in it. Yeah, of course there's hard work, it, but you're going to be doubted along the way. And who's to say, um, you won't be a smash, you know, slam dunk. I don't let anybody, uh, push me off of my path and, and, you know, kind of, uh, discourage me, I suppose. I don't let anyone discourage me. I'm undiscourageable, actually. I'm like, oh, you don't like that idea? That's cool. Well, uh, I'll send you a VIP ticket and you can come see it when it's, when it's up. But I, um, I just, uh, being grounded back home, I realized I wanted to cherry pick everything I liked, but the spotlight. I don't want that. I would love to be a part and an agent for other people. I have a lot of friends that I, um, I help with contracts. The Egg Sisters, I love you guys. I love them so much. I got to hire them too. Um, multiple times. I get to rent one of their wigs for a commercial and they shipped it to me from Chicago. Um, they are amazing, wonderful women. And uh, I just, uh, I realized that if I had my own thing here, I could hire my friends again to come see this wonderful place where I live and experience this weird place that's bred a Jackie, because this is a really, really unusual place. And I'm related to at least 25% of the population, probably 50, maybe 50. <laughs> um, so it's just a little unusual place, but we need science. We need math. We need things that stimulate our kids because unfortunately our area, uh, because it's seasonal, we deal with a lot of depression. We've had a lot of suicides this year already. Uh, and that's when you live in an area that's islands, you know, the names of the people that have died and you know why they died and you know, their parents and you know, the school teachers that taught them and it impact, it rattles a community differently than a city. And not to say it doesn't there too, but hundreds of people may know this one young man or young lady. And, uh, I can't, I feel obligated to uh, bring this magic and beauty and entertainment and happiness and the best of humanity that kept me so happy as I traveled to people here because you, it's a lot to expect people to be able to travel. I know a lot of y'all listening have run up credit card debt going to Comic Cons because who hasn't? It's an expensive hobby to travel and go to Comic Cons. And in an ideal world, we'd all have something in our neighborhood. Our, all of our local communities would have some kind of event where people could just walk to it or drive to it from their house not very far we need more things that are locally driven and i think I, that's i did the front lawn con a couple yes of you did the front lawn con that's right you're great for community outreach though that's something you've always had a like a superpower in that and bringing people together in a community and i've you know i'm learning a lot from you by reading your books <laughs> um with the spotlight uh stuff because was there ever a time that you really wanted the spotlight or the spotlight was just a byproduct of what you actually wanted? And um, what would you say were the biggest red flags with spotlight life? That's interesting. Okay. So um, did I ever want it? I don't know. I don't think I knew what it was. Like I, I, I know celebrities and I'm like, Oh, Beyonce, you know, like I never want to be as famous as Beyonce because Beyonce, she look at her. What is she really? She's not even in the spotlight because she hates it so much. She, she's, you know, retracted. She's, a, she's very strategically put in the spotlight. Um, people would say, oh, what do you mean? Of course you want to be Beyonce and have all that money. What do you do with all that money when you have it? Because I can tell you, I wouldn't be living extravagantly. I could tell you right now, hand to God, I would not be. I believe in your, when your pockets are full, run over and let it, I would, y'all don't even know what I'd be doing if I was rich. It'd be nuts. I would set up so many things in my town. Y'all be coming here like Jackie's town is the best. If I was Warren Buffett, I would be returning. I would make the place that I choose to call home epic. And every rich person should. I don't understand why not. If you got so much that you got 17 Lamborghinis or a hundred car garage in your mansion in Colorado or whatever, you should be doing something for your community, y'all. Let's be real about that. But they say, oh, it's their money, their decisions. Maybe it is their money. I don't know. How do you, do you know how they made it? That's the way I feel. I don't know. Life is a uh, very complicated, very layered, but in a general rule of thumb, I believe if you have an abundance, you should share. You should share, not in the way that I'm saying universal basic income or whatever. I'm not trying to get controversial with it. I'm just saying your obligation to your fellow human. If you see your local school isn't doing great and you're a billionaire one a mile down the road, buy some books for your school, buy them all laptops, do whatever you can do within your means. Take, take a group of kids out to lunch to make them feel like an adult cares about them. Whatever it is, again, not everyone's going to agree with my perspective, but that is my perspective. And just like the rest of the world, I'm entitled to it, you know? And uh, so I think if I was in the spotlight, 
I wouldn't be able to do as much as I could outside of it. I think the pressure of the spotlight for all the reasons I just explained all those extra layers of this, these people won't agree with this. The spotlight comes with the court of public opinion. And I don't give a crap about that. And that's the honest truth. I don't, because I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know if it's real. I believe, I know all about bots on the internet, propaganda. I'm very well, very, you know, very uh, knowledgeable about how the world works. I pay attention and I just don't, unless you are saying it to my face, which people do, I get a lot of criticism from my family. They're the best criticizers. They're amazing. They've, they've made me resilient, which I wish everyone was resilient. I, I can't thank my family enough, my extended family, my seven great aunts and uncles, everyone for their true loving criticism of me through my whole life. And uh, so I feel like uh, if I, when I saw the spotlight, I guess, I guess the closest thing to the spotlight in our community is like Jessica, Yaya, um, a lot of my friends like that, Alicia Marie, there's a lot of people that are in the spotlight and um, they were thrust into it younger in their lives many years ago, a lot of them. And uh, I think that they would even have reservations about being in the spotlight now. I think they would honestly tell you it's not their favorite thing because of the, the way the world is changing. The world is changing because the internet is a little, you know, the internet's a little harsher these days and it's going to continue to be as the quality of life of our people decline. So I just don't see the spotlight as, as being a healthy place for the people in it or the people watching. And um, so when I saw that, I guess I always thought like, it'd be cool to have my art in the spotlight, like Vulpin, my friend Harrison, he, his art is in the spotlight and he loves it. But um, can I tell you the truth that I just don't think I'm that stellar? I don't think I'm some Picasso or some Michelangelo that is worthy of being the top of my community. I, from a distance and up close, admire a, a huge amount of people in my community to the point where I would rather be in a, I would rather be a job creator for them than just uh, just milking the jobs for myself. I like uh, watching their skills grow and, and, and being like a nurturing kind of basket for my friends uh, because I don't feel that burn inside of me to be uh, you know, in the New York Met kind of artist. I don't care if my art is ever you know, displayed by art critics. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, you know, to be told, like I've been an art judge all these years in the cosplay world. I am not qualified to judge y'all's work. I was put into it because I can look at it and see what you've done. I understand all of it. And uh, that's why I judge. I don't judge because I'm, I think I'm better than anyone. I think that's nonsense. Um, art is truly subjective. It's that we say that for a reason. So I think uh, I couldn't find a spotlight that felt healthy. I kept, I was like maker and, and costume patterns, uh, host, um, all the entertainer. I found all these moments and people say, what do you mean? You were on the stage in front of 10,000 people multiple times. You know, I, uh, I get, I, I guess I enjoy that to a degree, but here's the truth. Like last year when I walked across that stage and see every cosplayer, I don't even notice the crowd anymore. It's just me and that line of people coming up or that little girl in that costume coming up or the, you know, the mom coming right behind her, Tiffany. I, uh, it was different for me. It felt different, but it was scary. I was scared. I always felt like, man, I, oh, half these people probably hate me. I don't, you know, we get in our own heads for no reason. So of course, like the spotlight um, had its appeal to a degree because it allowed me to be on stage in front of the world with my, my community. It felt like this special interaction between us, but um, it never, you know, it was what it was. And I never found fulfillment in it. And the worst part is the adrenaline, the adrenaline and the excitement and the endorphins go away really fast. <laughs> You know, it's like after you've been on stage, you're like, oh man, what's the next? Do I chase it? You know? Well, I found more often than not that usually some of my biggest moments of depression usually come right off of my biggest acclaims or successes or things like that. That, uh, you know, for me, San Diego, getting to go to San Diego and actually do a panel, to do panels and, like literally one of my happiest moments of last year and probably my life was getting my first professional badge was at San Diego's 50th convention and like literally seeing my name and professional. And I'm like, I stood in that giant hall and like with tears in my eyes, I was like, yay. And then like coming home from San Diego was like, I'm dying. Like, yeah. cause it's like all of, all of that. And what, like all of that. And then you're still alone with yourself at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and how can the real world compare? How can coming home, paying your taxes, paying your water bill compare to that fire 
that ignition moment of walking across that stage and interacting with the audience. Like there's, there's nothing like that. It really isn't. And that, that's one of the things that uh, I've learned. And, you know, honestly, I've, <laughs> I've learned a lot from the Christian hip hop community. Um, but uh, <laughs> like one of the things is that uh, we're not made to be worshiped or made yeah. to worship. And mm -hmm. whenever we put ourselves in the place where we have to actually find our validation from the praise of people, we're like turning ourselves into a false idol and mm -hmm. that's never going to be healthy for our spirit, our heart, our mind. And uh, like, yeah. I, I find that anytime that I have a compulsory need for attention, validation, likes, comments, anything like that, if there's ever a point in time, cause I, you know, it's, it's a struggle sometimes. If there's ever a point yeah. where I feel like uh, I need this, then I know it's not healthy. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going through the same thing. Like I, and I've been, it's easier now. Like I, people may think, oh, well, you, you never feel that way. Of course I felt that way. Just like you, especially in the earlier days, that's kind of how I got so sucked into it was because uh, you, you're like, you do begin to question uh, why so many people like this or don't like this or watch this. I had to actually over the last two years kind of change my brain. I mean, I prayed to God to change my heart, which works. I, I know then if it, there will inevitably be some non-Christians that listen to this and look y'all. I'm not trying to beat you down with a sledgehammer with my, with my faith, but I, I'm with here with my faithful friend. Yeah, my 75 sledgehammers. But I'm here with my faithful friend, and, this is, and I'm going to talk about my faith a lot. And I hope that in this you know, world that we demand tolerance in, it's also okay to be a Christian still. You know what I mean? Like in, in this society, we should really be a lot kinder about allowing people to talk about whatever the heck they feel comfortable talking about, since that's what they're you know, requiring of everyone else. But I, um, I just think it would be easier if we all calm down a little bit, but I, um, I definitely stopped finding validation in anything to do with social media and the internet. I really just, um, I don't know. I realized how void of real long lasting emotion and, um, and like, uh, fulfillment it was, it wasn't, it didn't last very long. Like you're saying with the stage thing, neither did, um, you know, if I made a costume, it may blow up one post and then it was like 150 hours in this costume and it does mediocre online. Why would, I'm, I don't, mm -mm, you are not about to invalidate my amazing costume that I'm in love with because it only got 400 likes. Please, I'm gonna dress up. I'm about to show all these kids at Halloween what it's like in person because that's the fulfillment. And I'm gonna remember that memory for the rest of my life. It's different. I went to, I, y'all, I dressed up and went to my local library because they invited me one time. And I was like, look at me and these kids. It's great. It's, but I don't remember anything about any of my posts. You know, I mean, it, it, you really, I really think as a human, we aren't wired yet to make the long lasting and fulfilling memories online as we are in person. Like, I don't know how many generations of humans all online it will take to, uh, to find it, to find fulfillment in the internet. But I just, I don't find, it doesn't feel the same way in my heart or my brain. I just don't. So it's easy for me to kind of begin to uh, condition my brain to no longer care. And it's, I don't know. I, I know that I have a lot of friends who love social media and they, and they kind of push back on me. That's the beauty. Let me say something right now. I love a differing opinion. I paint every Thursday with a very differing opinion of mine um, from a school teacher. She's so, she, her perspective is just so different and she argues with me on everything and I love her. She's one of my favorite new friends. She's in her seventies and uh, she's taught me so much about the world by letting her critique everything I say. We don't fight, we discuss, we discuss. And I still keep my opinion and she still keeps hers except sometimes we change and sometimes we morph into the same one. I think that, uh, you know, that is something right there that we're, we're not putting a lot of focus on in our society is just calm discourse about things that we disagree on. I think it's Scott, Scott Fitzgerald said that uh, the sign of a high intelligence is the ability to hold two, um, or the sign of a top rate intellect is to hold two opposing ideas together and be able to reason them, you know, reason with them. We should all strive to do that. That's, and that's a man's, that's a law of the man world. And that's a, a thing from the man world. But if you aren't a Christian, there's something to take from that, you know? try to find uh, things in life that make sense about the way we should do things. And one of which is not, you know, obliterating each other online. But so anyways, I, I'm a t I am the tangent queen. I should have it tattooed across my forehead. <laughs> so now that you're, you're take, you said like what, one of your directions right now, you're taking yourself out of the spotlight. Um, what are you doing with yourself now? like just in terms of 
quality of life, pursuits, all the things like what, what you out of the spotlight, what's that looking like? So here's the problem with out of the spotlight is that I, um, well, here's, there's two, there's one main problem. I, um, I don't like being a, a voice of criticism without action, which is the way I live my life. And, um, I can't stand that all these things are going wrong right in front of my eyes in my world in my local community. And I mean, it, you have to start local. I know you're going to freak out and think, oh, I got to change healthcare and all the things on the macro scale. But if you think micro first, that's how you get started. And a lot of us are big thinkers, existential thinkers. The artist community that is something that is so powerful here. And I think that a lot of normal people don't realize artists are in general existential thinkers and that should be encouraged. We need outside the box strategy. We need creative opinions that go with the, the structure and the discipline. There's, there's, you know, so many different types of intellect. There's like seven types of genius or something. So we got, we need diversity for starters. And I started writing ideas as I've had a lot of free time this year. I've written like 30 solid ideas for my local community that are expandable. I came up with an app uh, development curriculum idea that someone even asked me to pitch to Lieutenant governor. Um, so I, I decided I was just going to write like Hamilton, y'all. I was going Hamilton up. I was like, wait a minute, look at this man. Like I watched this play three times in a week. And I was like, wait, Hamilton wrote a lot of stuff. And that's how he did it. You know, he just wrote a lot of really moving stuff. You can move people with words, just like you can move people with art. You know, I don't think I can effectively show it to you without jacking up our presentation, but there's a, uh, Hamilton sticker right here on my MacBook. The, the oh, why do you write? Like you're running out of time. I got Hamilton right here in the newspaper. It's, it's, it's popping up in my life. It's so funny. It's like God saying, you're, you get it. You're, you're doing right. Maybe, you know, but, um, so I started writing ideas and I started talking to people in power that about them. I, I just legit reached out to a local commissioner. I was like, Hey, you want to come have coffee on my porch? Why not? You can ask. They may say no. I talked to, um, our town manager. I scheduled a meeting with him. I talked to the mayor. I decided to see, um, if I could enact change, what the bureaucracy and red tape would be like. So I, um, I realized that I could, I could definitely, I can't develop manufacturing or anything that, that generates jobs like that around here. Job creation was kind of my, my big thing because I want to grow the population here, the full-time one. And um, I, I realized we don't have a tech industry and I love tech. Again, something that I got from Maker Faire that I really always um, you know, enjoyed was just like, how how big the tech industry is and just how much it includes and how diverse it can be and how non brick and mortar it can be and how work from home friendly. So it kind of works naturally as this world progressed anyway, because I started on this idea last year. And uh, I, um, so I've been working on an app and I've been learning and taking courses on app design and app development, which I never thought I'd be interested in, but now I kind of love. And um, I also, um, I thought I was going to, I still think, I guess, here's the, here's the double-edged sword and the spotlight thing. I don't want to run for political office. I hate politics. I have kept every single, my brother and I, I sit, we talk in the mornings. I sent him a picture this morning of my four texts from yesterday asking about what I was going to vote for. This is my thing of all my mailers so far. My brother's keeping his, my granddad's keeping his. We're unaffiliated as a family. So they're spending a lot of money on our household to figure out how we're going to vote. It's funny, actually. Um, we're enjoying it. Grandparents, on, Nana's unaffiliated. We're unaffiliated. Steven is. So when you're an unaffiliated family, they really can put a lot of money into you. And I think it's disgusting. I'm outraged on such an insane, I like my blood pressure goes up when I think of the $11 billion they've spent so far in this election and how this happened in our country and how we aren't rioting in the streets over this as well. It's insanity. Oh, it's their own money. They can do what they want with it. I don't care. Do you know how they made their money? Again, learn, follow the money. And look at the money and look at how money's talked about in the Bible. If you're a Christian, you know, it, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy that we're elevated, that we have this uh, race to the, the, the most amount of money kind of thing that's glorified in our society. Like this person's a billionaire. They must be a genius. I look up to them so much. Jeff Be Bezos is legit Lex Luthor. He is a terrible human all around. No one, his mother couldn't change my mind. That's, she wouldn't either. I'm sure. But no, mothers love their kids. I know. <laughs> I'm terrible about Jeff Bezos, y'all. But the thing is, I just think that we're glorifying a lot of things in our society that are distracting us, distracting us from our mission, our purpose. And so I thought about running for office because someone has to have, we, we need to start change. But the, po the political system is brutal. I mean, the things that they're saying about these people are so painful. And my uncle was a senator for 26 years from this area. And he, right before he, he resigned, they attacked him. 
we, we have um, in my family archives, like all the stuff they sent out. It was brutal and it was mean and they attacked his family and uh, his wife was battling leukemia. They're just mean. They're vicious little vipers, the way these people, uh, you know, play things. And this has been around for, for a long time. Propaganda is ancient. So I don't say like, this is this new phenomenon. It's, it's just something that we've let balloon like this, just like many problems in our society. And I, um, I know I need power to make change. I'm saying it out loud. I need power. Isn't that insane? Why? I don't want power. I don't want to wield power like a weapon over my fellow humans. I want collaboration. I don't want to be a solo uh, politician that makes money, dresses nice, checks all the boxes, say, says all the right things, and just like floats through, you know, um, Congress. Like I want action. I want humility. I want a team. I want collaboration. But our political system isn't set up like that. So I, I'm at this crossroads. I asked my cousin, I went to visit her the other day. I was like, what are, do you want to run? <laughs> because I don't want to run. She's like, I don't want to, it's her, her father was the Senator. I always thought she'd run. And now we're both like, Oh, we don't want to, but who's going to stand up for the people that need standing up for Jesus did. I saw a criticism on atheism. I follow the atheism board on red on subreddit on subreddit, because I need to know what you guys are feeling too. And people are like, Oh, Christian, you're a Christian. How can you even be friends with an atheist? For starters, please. Police, did you read the Bible, y'all? We are supposed to be walking a Christ-like life. I need to hear my friends all out, all around, and I think that um, one of the criticisms they, you know, they talk about is uh, Jesus. They're like, how can y'all be Christ-like? Jesus, he, he, you know, he was with the sick and the poor and the depraved and all these things. You know, he, he stood for these people and helped them, and that's how we should be. My Nana is the most upstanding Christian, Christ-like critis, uh, Christian I have ever seen. I've never seen, she every single week takes food to the poor. Every single week takes clothes to the poor. She, she tithes, which agree or disagree, she tithes. And she believes in tithing in other ways. She says, if you are giving your time to the church, you're tithing, honey. She's a wonderful woman. She, she's very active in her community. She speaks to every single person. She's, she's been a wonderful example for me. So I do understand the criticism of Christians. I get it, you know? And um, now with what you mentioned before we, we started recording about Chris Pat, Pratt, me as a 34-year-old millennial, when Christian is waning more than ever in my generation, if I step forward and here I am, I'm a Christian and I want to be your leader in some way, whatever form that may be, I'm going to isolate a lot of people by being open about my faith, but I, I can't not be. And that's why I started opening up online, a place where I've never talked about my faith because I just didn't feel like the internet was, I, I was myself and then I was myself online. And that's the truth. And everyone is. I'm telling you the truth. And um, I left my faith out of my online persona, but I did say, God bless you to people at, at conventions and stuff. And uh, I offered to pray for people multiple times. And I did, I didn't hide that. Um, but I didn't put it out there in your face because I just, you know, like I said before, but the thing is, um, I don't think I can be like that anymore. I don't think I want to be, I don't think I care. I think that I, it, it, it doesn't, it dilutes me as a Christian if I'm not. And so I don't care about being canceled like Chris Pratt, you know, talking about canceling him. That's shameful. I don't cancel Justin Bieber. And, oh yeah. He spit on kids. He smokes weed. How can you think he's a good person? You know, look at what he's, you know, perpetuated. He's the first human to the first human ever to grow up. Like he grew up in the spotlight online from a bait from a, a under 10 year old all the way up. We can't, how can we expect him to be normal? And then he turned to God. And with, with the most negative spotlight on him about, he saw what happened to Kanye West. He saw what happened. Oh, he's so crazy. He's, how can you, you know, Kanye West isn't a real Christian. He's so crazy. Why can't, because they can't believe God could change our hearts because they don't, they're non-believers. We have to understand their perspective. I get why Kanye West looks crazy. To me, he looks, he looks like he's drunk with the Holy Spirit. To me, he looks like, yes, God has given us a leader, a, one of you know, a celebrity who is not a great leader in that regard, but broken vessels, you know, or imperfect vessels. But what Kanye West has done is said, screw the mainstream. I'm putting God first. And I listened to his whole album and he did. He talks about God and his stories are wonderful. And uh, he's unorthodox and he's not ideal, but at least he's making the turn. He's making the turn. And, and, I, and I just feel this weird thing of, I know anybody that's present on the internet is going to get pushed back, like Chris Bratt and things like that. But um, we have to be resilient and we have to be tough and we shouldn't be cowards. I just don't think we should be cowards because even our opposition will, res 
I believe I have faith in the atheist community and the non-believers because I have people I love in that community. I love them with all my heart. And so to me, it's like, if they, if you will allow me to be who I am, I will allow you to be who I, you are, but maybe you want to listen to what makes me the way I am. Maybe you see the way I'm living my life and why I'm happy and what makes me happy and the way I treat my family. And maybe that inspires you. That's what we, you know, a, a try to be as Christians but I do understand a lot of us do it, you know, do a disservice. I think it says in the Bible, like bad Christians make us look pretty bad, you know? So I get it, but I'm hoping that maybe if, if God pushes me into politics, which seems like, why would he do that? Please push someone else so I can be behind them. I want to be a campaign manager for someone else. <laughs> um, ben Wyatt I, all day. What? I said Ben Wyatt all day. Yeah, there you go. So I, um, I love Ben Wyatt. That's awesome. Um, I hope that if I do push out into politics that people will see, you know, people, will, I don't know, see that it's a good thing and not like, Oh, she's selling out into the political world. It's, it's just been talking about politics even before this season. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was, I was talking last year about it um, because I, I was going to run for mayor, but my uncle's mayor. So I'll let him have that <laughs> small town y'all small town, <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I realized that uh, I have to do good. I can't, I can't live this life of um, the problem with the, the cosplay life or the um, online entertainer life. That's really the most encompassing thing is that uh, it does become a lot about you. You are the central focus. You're the person that people uh, react to. They don't care about everything around. They don't care about anything else in your world except for you. You're the center of it. And so I realized like, uh, how do I, how do I use this clout? Oh. That's a word I watched. I watched a documentary last night about social media's impact on children. And they talked about the clout chasers. And um, if you have a lot of clout, I feel, and this is going to make a lot of my famous friends angry with me, I'm sure. I feel like you're required to do good with it. I just feel like we should. And that's not religious. I think that's human. I think that uh, a lot of us get stuck in our own narratives. And you've experienced this, Hector, where they, um, they think they're doing right. They're like, I'm empowering. Don't you see that that's what I'm doing? Don't you see that I'm empowering people? Why can't you see it? What do you mean you see it a different way? I'm empowering people. Do you talk to the people you're empowering? Do you go out into the real world, not on the internet? Again, it's not, it's not the same. Do you go out into a school? I talked to my high school on stage. I did that, y'all. It was weird, but I loved it. I'm going to talk to the other high school too. Um, they are not processing these things the same way you think they are. Talk to some parents and see what these 10 year old or 11 year old girls online on their phones 12 hours a day are doing and thinking about. You have to try to remember what it was like. It's very hard for us as we get older. It's like our brain closes those chapters, you know? And we have to try to remember how they're seeing us and what they're taking from it. They're taking the most glamorous, exciting parts of it because that's what entertains children. And uh, I think that we're doing more harm than we realize in a lot of ways. And I think we don't want to accept it because we hate being wrong, but I'm okay with being wrong. If I'm wrong on this, I'd love to be, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. I think based on the young people I'm meeting, I've been talking to young white boys, young black girls, young, um, oh gosh, see, dude, I just, I'm so, I'll say minority. You, you, I, I say some things that you, you know how it is. The internet is crazy. They'll fix it on one part of it. My grandmother calls, says some things. Sometimes I'm like, Nana, please, please. You got to work that out of your vocabulary. Minority is still acceptable, right? So I talk to a variety of young people. Let's say that. And uh, you know what the common theme is? Social media. It's always social media. Even the ones that aren't on social media are distraught by how much their friends are on social media. So I don't know. I think we got some problems brewing that in 10 years are going to come to a head that we aren't prepared for if we're not already occupied by China at that point.